all right guys I'm back again <clears throat> pretty sure that i will eventually put these up on my youtube channel but um yeah i'm just gonna keep on recording video of me talking about poker because i'm in a really big hurry to get better and talking through every single decision and every single hand i think it's um sort of equivalent to taking notes in class you can uh you know even if I don't necessarily review these videos words for word or every hand word for word, um, one, the information will be there if I want to, and two, I think I'll get a significant amount out of um, at least identifying, and maybe it'll take me watching through some of these one time to pick out the spots where I'm you know, actually saying I don't know what to do here. And those are the spots that obviously might need some more work. They also might be the spots that don't matter, but that's something that, you know, I want to figure out and not assume. Also, I think I'm going to do something new. I'm going to read a uh, quote at the end of every video, like a motivational quote, because um, yeah, I'm <laughs> trying. I'm working really hard at poker all day, and uh, so far my results are, are since the since I started playing in the new year have been awful, and I am not happy about that so i've been looking at you know some motivational quotes some stuff to kind of keep me going all that fun stuff um so i'll share some of that with you at the end of each video also maybe it'll help me um it might help me uh retain viewers for longer right because if you know there's a quote at the end of the video you might yeah, if nothing else, at least skip to the end and, and listen to what the quote is if you get bored watching the video, but that's something new that I'll be doing starting with this video. Uh, I think I can just call here. This is obviously a raise. This is obviously a call. So I went for a walk outside, got some fresh air, and now I'm back, ready to go for another couple hours. Um, then I'll probably just relax and get some sleep. Um, here we've got an open, a three bet, and we're sitting in the big blind with eight. This is a spot I don't know anything about. We've got a fish here that might call, so I'm gonna call. Pretty much just use any piece of information I can to lean what I think is a fairly zero EV decision one way or the other. And, um, you know, the fish is in the pot, so I think that leans it towards calling. We get pretty much the best flop we could hope for that doesn't contain an eight. So that's really good as well. Uh, you know, there's certainly no, no way that we can fold at this point. Um... Yeah, I think we can pretty much fold here. Two, two things could be happening when our opponent bets, I think. One is he could have been, you know, C betting with overcards, of which many of them just hit. And two is he could have been betting an over pair, of which many would check. Um, he could be double barreling as a bluff, but given the board, given the scenario, I find that less likely. He could also be barreling with uh, flush draws, but again, it was into two people. We have no reason to think that he's doing that. I think just population-wise, we can probably determine that into two players and then you know double barreling and betting into two players, there are going to be less bluffs in his range than there should. I don't think that board encourages more bluffing than any other board, and therefore what would be, I think, a solver call becomes a in-practice fold. We'll mark it for review. Hmm. 
yeah, my uh, results so far. I, I didn't start playing until I, I was sort of. I was so honestly like I was having a bit of a rough patch in poker towards the end of the year. I applied for the coaching for profit with Nick Howard, and I pretty much didn't play any hands until I heard back. I, I played some like sort of in between once I found out I was one of the finalists. Um, I was actually waiting on that right after I found out I was one of the finalists. Um, I find I found out that um, I was being looked at for a potential job which was a very good job and so i had like so much stuff that i was sort of like on the cusp of finding out that uh i wanted i I, like i don't know i just sort of like got frozen with uh i became very unproductive just waiting to find out like am i going to get in the cfp program am i going to get this job like i just had no idea what was about to happen in 2017 and uh turned out that i got the cfp didn't get the job so here we are um if it could be one or the other i think i would prefer that it went the way it did both would have been nice um but if it was one or the other yeah um i want to figure this poker thing out and uh I've been saying it for like three years now. I'm either going to, you know, figure out if I can actually make money or stop playing. And three years have gone by and I haven't actually uh, stopped playing and I haven't really started making a whole lot of money. So kind of keep just kicking it down the road, which isn't all that inspiring. This hand's getting fairly complicated but as confusing and as difficult as it looks i think it's fairly straightforward as a call it may not be a call in practice it's definitely a call in you know optimal play land and it's definitely a fold in practice on the river I'm guessing player three is a short stack. See, somebody mentioned this in the chat the other day. I was, thought it was pretty funny. They were like, why are the short stacks always the ones that are like, you know, putting the Zs in? I mean, it's it was sort of a poke at one of the short stacks, somebody else said. And I catch the chat occasionally. I don't really look at it. Um, this is going to be a fold. But uh, the, the too, too many cards got there, right? Like too many of his bluffs are no longer bluffs on the river. And then add that to the fact that we think the population is under bluffing and it, it becomes a pretty clear fold with second pair. So the, the reason that short stacks obviously do that is they're the ones that are only on one table because they're out of money or, you know, they're either usually, usually pro short stackers aren't doing that. <laughs> and uh I don't know if there's too many pro short stackers on Ignition either. It's probably one of the reasons that it's a pretty good site. Although I do wish Ignition would up the minimum buy-in, at least 50 big blinds. I think 50 big blind min buy-in would be really good for the environment. Like and like good for like the fishiness of the environment too, right? Because like pro short stackers just like um, lower everybody's win rate. I mean, I guess it's good for the site, but uh, Ignition does a bunch of stuff that's not good for their site. That's good for the Maybe it's good for their site in the long run, but I mean, they do, you know, there's a reason that it's um, this sort of software does well. But that's one request I would have of of Ignition because I think there probably are. And I know that like when you get up to like 100 and 200 no limit, there are going to be some, some pro short stackers, even on Ignition, even though you can only play four tables. Oh, did I mark that other hand? What hand did I? I wanted to mark a hand at some point. There was a hand I played somewhere. Hmm. I guess we could mark that one for review. I think that one was fine though.
you know, one thing I wonder is because I've been putting in so much time studying, I haven't been playing that many hands. And I, I, I mean, I still have like, it's a, the list of stuff I have that I'm like, all right, these are some things I want to study is very long. Like there's a ton of, like I have a huge list of stuff I want to do in each like spot. And so I'm kind of waiting for, um, a little bit of like my coach to make sure that I let, I'm going to let him kind of specify which order I go in and what things to prioritize because I have a tendency. And I think one of the reasons that I've had trouble over the years is that I, I kind of go down rabbit holes and I'm not always studying and focusing on all of the most relevant things to study. Seems like a good flop. Oh, you know what? This was a bet. I, I just snap checked this. Multi, well, it's going to work out fine, but multi way, we, um, we typically, the hell are we up against? <laughs> what the fuck's going on here? <laughs> All right. Well, that worked out fine. But, um, yeah, I think the general strategy is in multi way pots with like the top of your value range, you just kind of bet out, uh, allegedly. So I'm not, I'm not 100 sure but that one obviously went fine but this guy actually is short stacking so he just rebought for the minimum he just rebought for 15 uh so yeah like that's not great for the games at all so we don't really want short stackers um now we assume that they're probably like not professional short stackers they probably aren't even that good but uh short stackers i mean if you think about how annoying or good they allegedly were I, I didn't really know too much about it back in the day i just knew all the coaching sites i watched talked about how like bad they were and how evil it was to short stack but realistically i guess if i mean it's poker if you're making money you're making money um i just don't want to put in the amount of work to develop a relatively boring bot like way of playing and i think because of rake it makes it really hard i would imagine I feel like the deeper you play and like the, you know, the, the higher above the rake each pot is, then the, the more win rate you're capable of. Anyway, I don't want to talk about short stacking too long. Point is that, I don't know. I don't recall where I was going with that. Yeah, totally forgot. Totally lost my train of thought. Um, not sure what I want to do with this hand. I, th I think we're probably going to lose to like eights through kings a fair amount. He may bet some of those for value, and that makes me not sure if I want to call. I think I should call. There's not... Sucks if he has like 6-7 or, you know, like a better 7 where the kicker plays since mine doesn't. I feel like I either get value towned or I just see air. What? So what happened here? He bet the flop, he bet check bet, which is typically a value line. However, this run out is pretty unique and I feel like he wouldn't have checked back a king on the turn. I don't know, I'm probably just, okay, cool. I'm not, I'm trying not to like overthink things when, you know, we have like a sort of straight pot odds type situation. I don't wanna go like crazy down the rabbit hole of, um, you know, population reads and line reads to the point where I'm like folding in a spot where I'm completely under repping my hand. Like it looks like I have just stone cold air. I need to slow down a little bit. I think I'm clicking buttons a little bit fast because um, this guy's half stacked. So it may be a spot where I actually wanted to bet slightly larger than normal because i might think that because he's half stacked he may be a fish and if he's a fish his calling range is not going to change drastically based on my bet size uh, let's see here i three bet a six five i mean this is still probably a a c bet even though it's into two players like that is a very strong board and like even against two players it might be strong enough to see that i need to i don't know about that i'd have to like i don't even know how you'd model that i guess you would have to model something that you think is a combination of both players ranges and frequencies which i don't i don't exactly know where i would start with that but i know i have a three card straight and a pair 
and I can actually make hands with a lot of equity fold and hands with um, um actually I, I don't think I can fold this yet I can make hands with a lot of equity fold like king queen and I can make um better uh worse hands call right worse hands can call like if he has like six eight or six seven or uh, six queen or things like that so the second king comes um Hmm, hmm, hmm. Uh, hopefully we actually get a showdown here i i don't know if i want to fold a6 okay so he actually had two pairs so pretty standard uh raise for him and he checked back so that also indicates that when he is betting we should be folding right so like that's a correct check back probably but also notice that he's not betting crazy thin or actually sorry so I said that when he bets because we saw that when he bets we we fold that's actually not true because we just saw that we know that his betting range is completely polarized so it it's a matter of trying to figure out like does he get there with more bluffs or not and i think when he is right when he's betting it's i mean after the turn goes check check and he bets the river right like it, there's very very few combinations that he is going to bet with there for value so it it makes it so you have to really consider that he could be bluffing now i don't know if that guy is going to have enough bluffs in his range because we know players are more likely like to be under bluffing but i mean it might be a spot unique and interesting enough um to call i don't think i would because like king jack of clubs and king queen of clubs and things like that are a fairly large part of his range because there's flushes out there so i don't think i would have called a bet um again because i think he just ends up under bluffing in that spot but against the sort of aggressive somewhat balanced player or player capable of bluffing it might be a call So one thing I do like about the we value on ourselves if we bet here, like we just get looked up by like king ten, king queen, and aces, and we fold everything worse. I think, like we'd be like value betting against king eight or seven eight or something, right? Like it's just so little we can value bet against there that'll call. um what oh and now we should be able to look pocket three is a little thin i don't think we get a call from pocket threes So I was going through tons of hands today and just in one specific spot though, I was looking at when I three bet from either the small blind or big blind. And then I was examining spots where I checked the flop because I pretty much have a strategy now where I bet almost all of the flops. And uh, wow, I was, you know, some you know i looked at the i literally made a list of every flop i checked it was like i don't know there's probably like 60 or 70 hands that i went through that i checked the flop and i just jotted down what the flop was 
then I was going to go into PO and tonight overnight, I'm going to run a sim of all those flops and see essentially like how many of them I could have like near unexploitedly bet, right? Like a hundred percent because I'm pretty much betting a hundred percent on all flops in that spot. And there were a bunch of them that were like just slam dunk bets and that, that I was missing. So that's just like the first spot that I examined. And I'm thinking that pretty much every every like every little spot that I go into and do some more in-depth like research on is going to reveal similar results as well as is going to, you know, like one, show me how many mistakes I've been making. And then two, um, going through that, that exercise is going to, you know, help me like review a whole bunch of hands and learn the spot much, much better. And like what I did on this one is, uh, you guys know I like, well, some of you probably know that I like using Evernote. So I made a Evernote note. Um, see, these are all the flops that I checked on. And I tried to, what I did is I tried to rank them in order of these are the ones that I think are slam dunk bets to the ones that I actually think are really tough to bet on with 100% of our range. And so I'm going to run that sim overnight and then actually kind of be able to go through and, and learn a little bit about like which ones I was right about, which ones, you know, where they go and sort of rank them, I made some questions, went through, did some, some solver work, comparing different strategies, making notes. And so I'll just continue expanding that note as I go, as I do more work, as I do more study. And that's, again, that's all work I did for like one spot, big blind verse button. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the direction I'm going now is, you know, just working on understanding each spot, working on understanding each sort of uh, simplified strategy, as well as this should have been a bet, as well as taking into account sort of um, player pool tendencies and making sure that I know what kind of player pool tendencies might be uh, exploitable like for example um betting one check two like people bet when they're checked to too often and so you exploit that by check raising too often and then hitting straights i think i think i hit a straight on the turn <laughs> uh but yeah so you you kind of find the the areas where the, the pool is doing something that is outside of optimal and then you sort of ramp up your side of that a little bit and try to exploit it or you find a spot where like the pool isn't defending something as aggressively as they should and you know sometimes you you kind of you want to lean on it and exploit it and other times it's just information that you can use um to you know get away from spots that are bad again like the, the whole under bluffing thing I mean, I like I've got so many videos on here I and mean, you can go through and I've got lots of hero calls like people bluff and there's spots where I like think I'm making the greatest hero calls in the world. And some of them probably are. Some of them are me really reading the board well and reading the player well and understanding the situation and the hand range as well. And some of them are probably just me getting lucky. But um yeah, I'm pretty excited about about the work I'm doing, and uh, it's just intimidating to not like know where to start, to not exactly know how much time and effort to put into each place. Like, I, I don't want to spend a month working on big blind three betting, right? Especially if there's a strategy that pretty much just says like C bet pretty much all the time, and like even if I did that all the time, I'd only be making a mistake on like say eight percent of flops or ten percent of flops that's much better than I'm doing now, right? Like that's a lot better than I'm currently doing. This guy's kind of a fish, so I'm gonna call. It's pretty light, pretty light. Uh, pair plus backdoor flush draw. The fish actually folded, which isn't great. I don't know how many samples this is over. Uh, 
Yeah, like, I mean, in a vacuum, right? We can't fold this. Um, he's betting fairly large, like more than half pot. I think a lot of players, like half pot's sort of the standard in three bet pots. Um, we do have position, though. And um, so now we have a gut shot, but we lost our flush draw. If that was the seven of clubs, we'd be in business. I think we just fold here when he double barrels. He shouldn't double barrel too often with, like, kings, queens, jacks. So it really polarizes his range to, like, bluffs and ace king and ace queen so we can fold um maybe that's a flop like maybe we can get away with folding the flop there but i just i, I don't know if problem is there's two things working like one is the players aren't three betting enough usually and so their range is like stronger than average than like a balanced range and then number two is that they're c betting too often so they're like three like so like one thing working for us is that he is c betting too often but something working against us is his range is too strong so you can kind of see how those it's hard to exactly work out a balance on the flop now on the turn we really think that the player's probably under bluffing on that turn. So I think on the turn, it's a very, it's a very correct fold on the flop. It's definitely a theory. So into three players, we'll size up a bit and we'll, we'll bet into two players. Oh, did I say two or three? So yeah, on the flop, it's like a theory call and hard to tell if it changes in practice and if we don't really know if it changes in practice for sure then we should stick with like the theory call and then on the turn it's uh, it may even be a theory call again but definitely a fold in practice and probably a fold in theory as well um i think i'd rather bet here than than check Interesting. He called twice with worse. That's pretty impressive. Do, do you have a, a draw and then not... Um, what happened here? Did I call with King Jack off? That should be a three bet. That's bad. Did he limp? Oh, he must have limped. Yeah, I definitely make little mistakes here and there. So he must have had a draw? Oh, he called twice with the 10. Okay, that's fine. That, I mean, that, that makes sense. That's... It's fine. Everybody checked around the flop, so we should be betting pretty much 100% here, even though it's into two players. Definitely when we pick up some equity, makes it easier. Small blind versus big blind. I think we just bet a lot, especially on this flop. Uh, I don't think we need to barrel there. Although this guy's... We don't really have enough. We just know he's really loose. Um, let's bet one more time. Kind of a strange spot on table two. Wow, he actually checked back the jack high flush. <laughs> That's impressive. I guess he was scared of full houses and, and whatnot, but um, I mean, we would have had to have two pair or a set prior to and not raised. So I find it hard to put a lot of full houses in our range there. So again, just very passive, very passive. Again, going to show that like you can make big folds on rivers against some of these passive players. They're just not value betting thin enough. Um, what do we have here? I don't know if this, these guys were actually sitting in on this. So I'm not sure if this is under the gun or cut off or, or uh, yeah, like I don't know if there's a MPE or, or cut off open. I guess I could have looked. It should have the little, it should actually tell me what position players are in. There's a reason I added that feature from Table Tamer, and that's so that when that happens, when I don't see the action, I can actually look 
at the the table tamer info and and find out what the action was pre-flop it's actually pretty nice um jack nine suit is a pretty good hand to call with on the button we're gonna have a polarized three betting range on the button um in the small blind it'll be linear on the big blind it'll be polarized <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. seems like a pretty good one third we're gonna get just tons and tons of folds here it's a strange spot to raise uh it's so dry and like there's so few made hands and there's so few reasons to raise here like i would never have a raising here hand like i would never have a raising range here unless it was like every raise i ever made on this board would be a bluff if i was going to make it um I, I think it's a relatively easy spot to see why like bluffing would be good um so now he he actually checks uh i'm gonna i think we can bet fairly small and if he was just bluff raising then he'll he'll go away Okay, so somewhat of a thinking player, I you know identifying that okay, this is a board that doesn't hit a lot of people. Um, a lot of people would check back if they had a ten. I'm gonna bluff raise, um, and then once the you know once I call, okay, I'm done bluff raising. So you know, potentially thinking player that can read boards and sort of understand what's going on with ranges a little bit. Just a level behind us, that's all. Wow, that's a big... That's a big pump. Like that's really pumping the pot up. So let's just take a, we don't really have any hands going on right now except for this ace five, which we're gonna fold. Uh, I think, I think we're gonna fold. It's kind of a, a gut shot to like the worst, worst part, an overcard, and we're out of position. Again, I, I maybe theory wise that might not be a fold right away, but I think for us we're we're okay folding it. Um Trier Trier looks like our worst table, which is this one, twenty eight fourteen, um, according to players per flop. Um I guess we don't we don't fold the min raises, so I think I just call like 100% to min raises pretty much. Maybe not. Maybe I'm not supposed to quite call that light, but pretty darn close. Um, we can check raise this board. To, oh, wait. Oh, he checked back. Okay, we can bet this board. Maybe that's a call too. Uh, three, four, six, seven, nine. So we actually have showdown value. Um, I'm okay just checking and we might actually call because I mean he's completely polarized to like a nine or air when he bets there should be no other no other possibilities that are going to happen frequently enough that we need to consider I don't think maybe I'm missing something but let's see what he had king jack off um pocket tens looks like a good spot to check back this guy never folds the flop. I don't know. Let's get some more data on that. <laughs> there we go. And this guy never throw folds the three bets. So let's let's find out if that too is true. It's a big three bet. I'm making like pretty massive three bets, especially out of position. Uh, I don't know if they need to be that big, but I don't think it matters that like one I know that it doesn't like it's very hard to prove one way or the other 
So I don't think it matters too much. And then two, like the fishier players are going to call regardless. And then the thinking players are going to, you know, scale back and call less or whatever. Like pe people might adjust to it or, or whatnot, but I don't think it makes a huge difference either way. What's this guy timing down for? Okay, there's some better tables out there. This table has like nothing going on except for the guy directly to our left. So we are going to, we're just gonna leave. Let's just leave this table and get on a better one. Boom, nice, we got on the best table available. And let's raise. And let's barrel. So this this card looks like it helps his range, but I've talked about it before. It makes his it makes his defense. Um, it makes it so he's supposed to defend a lot, but an, an, like what I would call, or I guess I didn't make this up. I guess my my, my um, Nick made it up, but uh, an un, unnatural range. So he's going to have to call a very unnatural range on that turn. Um, same thing here on this deuce, right? Like a low card, right? A, a, a fairly dry board. We bet um, it's going to get called, like peeled a, a decent amount, but folded a decent amount. And then the two, um, there's going to be a lot of cards like in our opponent's range that he, if he did peel the flop light, that are going to have to defend an, un an unnatural amount, and it's going to be pretty tough. So even that, that that deuce looks like a blank, and it is. It it also makes it um, kind of overfolded. I think. I don't quote me on that exactly, but I think that's I think that's what it does. So I would say that we're running really good right now. Um, and the reason for that is we have gotten played back at very little on a lot of our like barrels and our, our bets and raises and three bets and stuff. And so I think it's kind of just important to recognize that because I often feel the exact opposite and I get kind of... Um, I was talking about getting kind of like tilted when like players are playing back and I'm having a tough time and I feel like something's happening that's that's that I'm doing wrong and it may just be variance, right? It may just be the variance in the form of my opponents actually have hands and it's good to sort of take a second to recognize like we've been incredibly successful with every bluff we've um you know we've made for the last you know 38 minutes since this video started i think for the most part like this this like most recent session our red line is probably doing very very well all right this table is not working pre-flop I'm kind of happy that I made my pre-flop raises 3x or min raise on the button because it makes it easier to scroll to the right amount and not feel like one table is doing something completely different than the other. Um, Pronovost. Pronovost? 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 Pronovost. Is... Uh, da, 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 da. the worst table I have right now and that's lower right so looks like we've got this fish this fish and this guy but these two are short stacked this guy seems pretty reggy and this guy's directly to our left so I wouldn't mind getting off that and Hoosers doesn't look great but we've got this guy to our right this guy to our left um, I don't know. Both these seem okay. So this guy just opened ships on the ace, giving us trips and putting a flush out there. I'm actually going to just fold. Um, 
I don't really see any value in like I mean I, I understand that this could be a bluff but like is he value betting worse like he's probably not value betting worse than trips here so either he has like some sort of weird bluff or we're like crushed like I just don't think that players are bluffing into two players by making that play unless he has like king jack with the king of diamonds I mean that's like that specific hand or something like that but that's getting pretty crazy putting him on a ridiculously narrow range when what he's kind of telling us with his bet is that like he has a really good hand right now and he wants to put all his money in so i mean we can mark that but i think that fold is fine the only the only data point that would argue with what i just said is that players are what is going on here let's just pot this um players that donk you know donk bets are bluffy and or merged like you know medium strength but i think the fact that it's like an overbet jam counteracts that pretty well and that it's into two players i think because of those reasons it, it counteracts it very well so we three bet uh we are in position i do think we want to just bet here because we can bet a third pot and um if nothing else that should get us a cheaper showdown um because we're allowed to check back and he he doesn't control if we check back so uh, let's check and he called so yeah i mean obviously checking back's fine here we're gonna be beat a few times oh queens yeah i wasn't i wasn't planning on turning uh jackson to a bluff there this guy's got 37 we've got two pair um um it doesn't look like a i don't know i'm not sure what to do here i don't know this i, I don't like calling i think raising's better i don't know I'm not sure because like some players might stack off here with king jack or ace jack um and then some players like are only going to call with better if we raise now I've got like, there's two flush draws out there, but I have position. If I was out of position, I would definitely just jam here. But because I have position, like I decide if the last bet goes in. So depending on the card, I, you know, can decide to jam or not jam. And he jam, wow. So I guess apparently bet, bet, bet out of position is kind of a bluffy line. I don't know anything about this guy and it doesn't feel like it's necessarily the best call. But if that's true that bet, bet, bet is a bluffy line, then there's only a few hands that make sense here, and there's a few draws that miss, so I guess we're going to call. Um, wow. That's pretty impressive that he just, like, went that hard with a gut shot. I'm a little... And then got there. That's um, That's irritating. So I don't know if I... Yeah, like I, I did see the straight, right? I saw the straight. I made the connection in my brain that he would have had to be barreling with four out and sort of discounted it. Not sure if that's correct or not to discount it like that, but I did. And now here we are. Oh, good. I have no stack. Awesome. Let's rebuy and then let's mark that hand because that was a freaking huge hand, an $83 pot review. Now we hit our gut shot. That's nice. I guess we could have checked back and taken the free equity, but the ace is a decent bluff card. We don't get paid with our gut shot. Nine queen and ace four. That's the same guy? Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. Well, um, yeah, there goes a buy-in. So I marked that hand for review. Uh, I mean, my thought process is right there on video. I, I don't know... There might be something I'm missing. I mean, if I go through and I look at, uh, so I mean, 
that's a question, right? Like that I didn't, I didn't vocalize is, is he value betting worse? <clears throat> and I know like on the flop, I mentioned raising because I think this might be the type of guy that can like stack off with like ace jack or like king jack. And so if that's my read of the player, then I think maybe he could be doing that with a worse hand that he thinks for value, but that, that seems optimistic, right? That feels optimistic to think that somebody on four three jack nine five is betting ace jack for value all in three streets right so i mean the barrels out of position were bluffs so that read was right uh, right up until the river this guy's turning into sort of a maniacal looking player like i I don't know. I, I don't think our play is so far outside of reasonable that it's worth talking about anymore. Uh, it's I'll post it. I'll take a look. I'll see what people say, but I'm not going to uh, like rack my brain over it from a guy who is playing 80, 50 over the last 10 hands. That's a lot. That's a lot even for 10 hands. I don't think we can quite fold here with King-10 suited. That's a nice flop. So here we're out of position. So we don't get to decide on if the last bet goes in. So we have to decide if and when we want to raise. That's a very large uh, flop bet. And it's two Broadway cards. So he can have gut shots. He can have pair plus gut shots. He can have enough. And we can rep enough draws that I think we just want to jam here. I mean, like... Could obviously call and then jam the, the river. But I think we can just jam here. I mean, he should call off with like king, queen, or ace, king. Um, okay, well... Maybe not. I kind of want to mark that just so I can see what he folded, what he bet folded. He bet really big. It was a three bet pot and he bet like two thirds, which I, I, again, we bet real small. We bet one third. So our, ours is not a standard bet. It's fairly small, but um, I would say that the standard sizing is half pot and three bet pots. Anyway, I want to mark that hand. That. Why? Ah, that's right. Table Tamer is not working on table one. Is table one any good? Can we just get off of it so that we can get a table where Table Tamer is like kicking in? I feel like that is a reason I leave my tables pretty often. Maybe not. Maybe not the best reason, but definitely a reason occasionally. Seven nine offsuit. Okay, let's look at our tables. We got, uh, I mean, 36% players per flop is our lowest. That's funny to even be considering leaving a table like that since it's so incredibly, like that's, you know, as high as you'll ever see during the day. 36% players per flop. Um, this would be a, a theory call, but short stack, out of position, I feel like just like mental energy preservation on table three is, is my reason for folding. And I don't think it's significantly incorrect. I don't think calling there is greatly higher than zero EV. Where is, where'd Camtasia go? Oh, okay. We're, we're 50 minutes. So I'll probably stop this one at 60. I guess we're going to put out a bunch of 60 minute videos. Uh, let me know if you guys are okay with that or if like you really want them to be shorter or if this length is fine. Um, you know, let me know what you think. Uh, <laughs> it went behind? I don't know. <laughs> what? I don't want to not be in the pot when everybody's limping and I have a suited hand. And, you know... I wish I was like, I wish I had better position on this guy. I guess this is the next best thing because I have position on him twice when I have the button. I you know like, in the in the cutoff and on the button. Um, 
So that's a good thing. Uh, this guy's donking out, which again, I mean, I think donks are generally like pretty bluffy. We're just going to raise uh, this. We're just going to pot. They're like bluffy slash merge. So what we'll do is we'll like bet here. And then if he checks again, we'll just fire again pretty, pretty blindly on the turn. I think, I think that's the strategy. <clears throat> Seems like a good card for it. And then the, there's no no playing coy here. We're just gonna bet with our ace queen. And again, I'm guessing he's fairly inelastic here, unless he actually has a queen. I, mean, I don't think he's. If I make this like 12, I don't think he's gonna fold any more queens than if I make it, you know, 625. Um, maybe even like half pot is okay there, but let's not let's not vary too too much. But if he has an eight, nine, ten, or jacks like a pair of any of those below a queen, then this should get like a whole bunch of folds. Um, if he calls with something like ace 10, then it's not gonna get a fold, obviously. But you got to fold, so who cares? This is not a great flop for ways. Uh, 9, 10 offsuit in the big blind is probably a flat call. And we're getting better than two to one with a pair of five, so I think we just call here. Um, yeah, we're good. No time. What a ten. Nah, we're fine. Easy game. And yeah, sure, we'll call nine ten off. <laughs> Seriously, F you. Oh, did I take all this guy's money? I don't know. Maybe I may have actually, like, I've got a lot of money here. I don't know where it all came from, but it's possible. Uh, I guess we'll just sit out next big blind on that table. And then actually, we'll probably take a break. We'll read our quote of the video, not of the day, because I'm making a bunch of videos today. So we lost a pretty big all in with um, a fairly light two pair call on the river, which I have no idea if it was correct or not still. Ah. <sighs> You know what would actually be interesting is I could add into, this is small blind versus big blind, so I think we like C bet a bunch, which is interesting. When I was in, I, I'm not in the study group I was in. Um, I was in a pretty good study group, but it kind of, like most study groups I've been in over the years, it sort of fizzled. And they were saying that um, our strategy was supposed to be <laughs> that concludes this period of thank you for your money. Thanks for having me on. Um, <laughs> all right. There we go. I'm not going to fire up another table until uh, after I'm going to sit out. I'm not going to leave these tables, but I'm just going to sit out so I can focus on reading my, my quote for the video. I'll have to actually find a new one before the end of the next video, or maybe I won't have one. We'll see. Okay, alt. Sit down next big blind. Just going to take a short break and then reset the video and then keep going. 
Um, oh my gosh, there's so many tables going. I'm going to keep playing until the games aren't soft. That's my goal right now is to just keep playing and keep talking through every single situation against every single player and trying to make the best possible decisions without getting tilted or spewing money because of the player type. But, I mean, this session went pretty well. We, we lost that one all in, but I think overall we did okay, right? Right? Yikes. We're definitely bouncing up and down, trying to trying to bounce back from a downswing uh, today. Yeah, we're sort of bouncing all over the place right now. <laughs> it's been tough. <laughs> this is, uh, oops, makes it hard to see. This is today. We're almost up to 1,000 hands today. So we're down 117 adjusted, 63 overall. Um, damn, working our trying to work our way back, but this has been a rough a rough go. Okay, so the quote we're gonna read, I'm sure many of you would have heard, but I think it's a good one to start out the quotes with. Um, and I'm sure you'll recognize it. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there's no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt, The Man in the Arena.